Hi, everybody. I got a great interview today. I hope you appreciate it. So there's this new movie that's hit the market. It's going to be a super hit. It's probably going to win some Academy Awards. It's called The Big Short. And it's geeky as can be. It's really technical about the housing bubble and how people made money out of it, but also what got it started. It's a really funny movie even though it's so complex and so i got like the perfect guy to talk about it he's uh anthony sanders tony sanders he's a distinguished professor of finance in the school of management at george mason university and he's a real estate finance expert so i'm uh, it's a huge honor to get him to come on and talk to me today via skype uh, uh, really appreciate it tony hey thanks john appreciate being here good so i i when I saw the big short was coming out, I was excited about it because I kind of lived it because I just started s selling real estate. And so I was, uh, I could see weird things going on and couldn't quite understand it. And it was probably after the fact I understood kind of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to talk to you just to see that I'm kind of concerned that despite all of that, that people don't really have a good feel for what really happened and mm -hmm. what lessons were learned? Did we really learn the lessons that could be learned? Um, the, I know you're a teacher and you're, you're really good at it and you use a lot of humor in your classes, but I don't think you can beat this movie in explaining technical issues like they had this one famous scene near the beginning where they have a supermodel in a bathtub explaining mortgage-backed securities. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be yeah, hard I to compete. I've seen that happen either, but that's going to be hard for you to compete with. But it really kind of um, locks in the <laughs> some of the technical jargon, which makes it understandable. They kept they would always have these actors. They would like look at the camera and say, mm -hmm. "Okay, now we're going to explain what a CDO is," and and they would go to Anthony Borlane or or a, a pop singer, and so that worked really well so uh, anyway i i think it's going to change the uh, whole attitude in the states about uh, the whole crisis because a lot of people didn't really understand it they're going to see the movie i bet three quarters of them are going to come out kind of understanding the the situation that started out as mortgage-backed securities were safe and then they just got worse and worse and worse and uh i i don't know maybe a quarter of the people will still won't get it but it will the popular culture will be changed i think by by this movie it will be okay well good so let me talk about uh and just go into some of the things that uh um well, well, well why don't you explain what you think there's a lot of explanations of what caused the the crash what do you think some of the basic uh reasons are is that that thesis that it was mortgage-backed securities that were safe and then they got started adding more and more high-risk loans until it was like huge amounts of high-risk loans, and then when prices quit increasing, after a couple of years of not increasing prices, the house of cards fell. Well, I posted on my blog site for George Mason University students, which is publicly available, I have the, the big short in one chart. And so I kind of show what's going on in the market at the time, all in one convenient chart. But let me give you the background. Starting in 1995, and there's a little lull, and they picked up again in the 2000s. The U.S. economy and the banks began a massive expansion of credit. And so credit was just expanding. The problem came in about 1999-2000, real median household income, which is income for households in the United States, began to fall. And so this big expansion of credit at the same time, incomes were falling in real terms. So what that means is, is that how do you make a lot of loans when incomes are falling? Well, it's one way to do it. You have to go to subprime loans, loans for people that have either poor credit, have declared bankruptcy, or have rotten credit scores. And at the same time, they also increase the percentage of adjustable rate mortgages, or ARMS, to the highest it's been in ages. Now, here's the problem with that. <clears throat> these are not plain vanilla ARMS that we might think of. These were all these exotic ARMS, pay option ARMS, where you pick a pay ARM, you can pick your own payment. I'm either going to pay off what my principal that I'm owed for the moment, or I can pick interest or pick nothing, no payment. And so all these things, again, declining incomes, um, increase in subprime lending, increase in exotic arms, it was kind of a blueprint for something that's going to blow up. And that's why I liked in the point where Christian Bale's talking about 
2005, everything's going to explode. Well, again, that was a little overselling it. I could see from the big expansion of subprime lending, the big expansion in credit overall, and then declining real incomes, something had to give. And something did give. However, we kind of waited until Q4 2007 to really blow up. It took a while. But that's basically it. Ex massive expansion of credit, declining incomes, and increase in subprime lending. None of those are together all good. Yeah, it's well, there we have it. Go ahead. There we have it. Now, the book by Lewis and the movie make it look like CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, were the villain. Yes. But that's, that's kind of stretching it. We would have had this problem regardless of whether it had been CDOs or not. So what happened with CDOs is, as you learned in the movie, um, it was just simply that banks were making a lot of subprime loans. Wall Street was buying a ton of them. And then when things started to turn around, they started dumping CDOs and, or uh, subprime mortgages into collateralized debt obligations, which are just another security backed by different types of credit sensitive collateral. It could be corporate debt, it could be subprime mortgages, et cetera. And then as they, as some, not everybody, as some people on Wall Street started to see these kind of iffy numbers, they started to short the market, which means they started selling short either CDOs or the underlying collateral, which was subprime mortgages, subprime mortgage-backed securities. And it turns out it was a big payoff. They were right. But Bernanke at this time, now, the movie makes fun of Bernanke a little bit, which I thought was kind of amusing. Bernanke did not see this coming. No. And a lot of people actually didn't see it coming. So, again, and as I've said to someone before, I said, you know, Christian Bale wouldn't have been so smug in the movie had the market actually ra rallied and improved after that point. Uh -huh. But the fact is the market went to hell, as we know. And so, therefore, ex post, everyone, all these people made a lot of money. But it could have turned out the other way. Yeah, I can see there was a couple of uh, guys in the movie who were younger guys. So I think you're going to get a lot more finance students because they're going to see that movie <laughs> and think it's a how-to instruction. I hope it's more A students as opposed <laughs> to C or D e students. <laughs> yeah, well, that sounds like you're. it's pretty much the same thesis as they had in the movie and the book. Yeah. Uh, and I knew a guy, uh, he was a finance guy he was an american but he worked out of london and he said and he worked with mortgages and he said you would put them in and they found if they put some bad mortgages in it didn't affect the rating at all so it's like they just kept adding more and more because oh well, that was one of the main points in the movie is that the rating agencies were one of the bad guys what do you think about that well one of the way the rating agencies work is that you actually submit like an excel file or some kind of file to whoever the rating agency is and they give you back a rating and if you started submitting in worse and worse collateral, you got to the point where the rating dropped. And so you withdraw the collateral. But see, again, and some people don't understand this, including, I think, kind of the movie. Uh, Lewis understands this, but he wasn't very clear. Um, Moody's, Fitch, et cetera, are very historically based. They're not going to shift ratings on some contemporaneous, what I mean by that is real-time change. So suddenly in the chart, which I, I hope you post, it shows this big spike in subprime, big spike in arms as incomes are dropping. They don't look at that and change the ratings. They look at like a, like four years of data. And so, now, can one month or two months of data change a four-year four time series? And the answer is no. Um, and so they, but that's just the way they do business. They said, so we don't want to be in the speculation market. We don't want to speculate what's going to happen next year. So we're just going to go use historical data. And then we'll tune our models that way. And it turns out if things go to hell, your models may not get tuned for, you know, a couple of months or a year. I guess they're too lagging, yeah. Yeah, they're too lagging. Yeah. It, I, elsewhere, I can't think it was in the movie or not, like Lehman Brothers had like a, a really high rating like a few days before it went bankrupt. <laughs> so, uh, well, that, that that's the kind of stuff in the movies. And, and of course, the other movie, Margin Call, had the kind of thing. When, Maybe that's where I saw it. It could have been Margin it, Call. It was, it was Margin Call, where Jeremy Sisto, the guy who plays Spock in the Star Trek movie, suddenly looks at us and says, oh, my gosh, we're in trouble. Oh, come on. If you look at house prices declining, delinquency shooting through the roof, how do you just wake up then and discover this? This was, this was a long time in the making. And if you looked at the data, like I was and you probably were at the time, 
you would have seen this. Was, this is not a shock to anybody. It doesn't make good movie if Jeremy <laughs> Sisto says, oh, my God, it's been going on for three years. <laughs> Better supermodels and bathtubs are more interesting. That's right. Exactly. So, so uh, let's talk about what could have been done because people keep saying, well, it was uh, the, they got rid of Glass-Steagall or the uh, Fed fund rate was at 1% for so long it pushed people into more risky investments. Uh, so w- was there anything that could have been done to prevent the, well, the boom and bust or yeah. to make it less less bad? Oh, I have a chart again, which uh, I'll, I'll send you again. Cool. I showed that during this time period, while housing prices were super accelerating in the first half of uh, 2000s, um, the Fed was also frantically raising rates at that time. They went from a very low rate and kept raising it so much that they got to the top and they actually may have contributed to killing off the housing market. Because once you get rates so, so high... What happens is, is that the market then kind of teeters over the edge and went kapooey. Then the Fed had to come in at lower rates again. So it could be, again, the Fed raised rates too fast, contributing to the demise. That's what I mean by, you know, uh, the Christian Bale character, you know, makes a lot of money in this movie. So does Littman at Deutsche Bank and some other people. But the point is, if the Fed had not done that, it's not clear that this market would have toppled over this quickly. It may have actually stayed up a little bit yeah but my the fed funds rate it's it's really loosey-goosey how it affects real estate because the mortgage rates weren't as your charts will show the mortgage rates didn't move that much even though the fed funds rate went way down from the mm-hmm. the tech bubble long one percent for a long time and then went st- steeply up until basically the economy and, and that's true and that's what a lot of the people in washington dc like to say the same thing however Remember, I said this is the time when they had the big subprime spike in yeah. loans originated. A lot of these things were arms, adjustable rate mortgages, which, by the way, are very sensitive, more sensitive to Fed funds target rate changes, short rate changes, yeah. than long rate changes. Now oh, we're in the Oh, that's situation. a good point. Because they're just five years, typically, or sometimes two years. Yeah. Or three. Three. Yeah, that can be really short. So then that, so, okay. And so so then are more affected by. So, the, so me Graphing the 30-year rate isn't really the appropriate uh, that minimizes the impact of the change in the fund fate, fund federal funds rate on it does the uh, adjustable. Okay. Now it does, but back then, when you have a big bubble, which is really brought up by adjustable rate, three, one, and five, one arm rates, and how they're impacted by the Fed funds target rate. Okay. Because when the Fed funds rate goes up, there's an expectation that short rates will all go up. Yeah. Okay. Not so much the long run. Okay. So what do you think about the Glass-Steagall? Anything to that, that that was uh, at base or allowed this to happen? That's if, When I meet like with in-laws and stuff, that, that copper comes up. And the answer is, is that all the rest of the banks were going away from that model, a separation of investment banking from commercial banking. It would have left us as like one of the only countries where we had this merge, the, the two were kind of, separated by a wall. Now, the question was, how's, how real was that wall? Well, some banks had, again, what we call, I hate to use these terms, Chinese wall or Japanese wall. But it's thin paper walls. I was at one bank, and like right across the hall is their government security section, which is an underwriting branch. So I said, are you really separated from the bank? They looked at me and said, sure. So I'm not really sure it was that big of a deal. I think most banks had already figured out how to c- collaborate with an investment bank okay. before then. So it wasn't, wasn't that tough. It, okay, yeah. that was been a fact. So then let's go back. Can you have any ideas of how it could have been prevented? Or maybe we should talk about all the regs, the massive regs that came afterwards. Would that have, would those have prevented this from happening? Well, let's take a look in hindsight. Um, the regs that we put into place now, for example, Dodd-Frank, well, Dodd-Frank wouldn't have prevented anything. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau might have, but the CFPB essentially has gone through and eliminated some lending. They've eliminated any exotic arms, so all we're left with is what's called plain vanilla arms, which means, you know, you know, if they are Fannie and Freddie buy them, they're very simple, uh, three, one, five, one arms, no, no, no tricks, no teasers, nothing. Um, would any of that prevented it? Sure. But again, we're overlooking the fact that uh, 
you know, the legislation was put into place, not legislation, sorry, uh, the National Home Ownership Strategy was put into place in 1995, okay. which called for loosening of underwriting standards for banks and Freddie and Fannie. And that's kind of started the ball rolling on, uh, on you know, this dramatic increase in subprime lending and that kind of stuff. It kind of went away during the recession. Remember the 2000, 2001 recession? Then it came roaring back after that. So th all the pieces were in place. So that so those was actually, so those changes legitimized, so to speak, the high risk loans, the the subprime. Well, what it did was it's the it's the, the government policy is saying we want more expanded credit. We want to kind of loosen underwriting standards to give lower income, medium income households a chance for the American dream. It turned into a nightmare for millions of people, but you know that again was well intended. Um, piece of let's look at national home ownership strategy look it up and you'll see what it does it, and again I'm not blaming the entire thing on that but it was kind of the mindset let's yeah. keep expanding culture and, or expanding lending you know, somewhat for political reasons but um, it just didn't go away and we've been doing that and then finally blew up in our face yeah I, my when I first got licensed I said 2004 I started taking it seriously I remember going to an event this, Real estate agents have all these events where title companies or mortgage companies put on to educate you. So I went to one and I was talking to this guy beforehand and uh, I didn't know anything, sold maybe three homes. And this guy was a mortgage guy and he kept telling me he was looking for this thing, subprime loans. And I'm thinking, this doesn't make any sense. Why would he be looking <laughs> for something that's a bad loan in my mind? But he kept, he, he didn't want to hear about it really well qualified people he was wanting to look for some prep i could figure i said well i'm new to this industry this is one of those crazy things in every industry you don't know the hidden agendas and then years later or a long time later i figured out what it was is those he would make two to three times the amount of money if he sold a subprime loan than a prime loan which seems nuts uh, but the econo economics works, and the economic incentives were create for a while. The, the prime loans. The spreads were much bigger. I remember the first time I saw coming across my desk, a um, it wasn't a subprime deal, but it was something with greatly, re you know, average credit score was much lower than the Freddie and Fannie type product. And, and it also had no doc and low doc lending. This mm. was a non underwritten credit was actually pretty good. But I said, who the heck is going to buy loans that haven't been underwritten? What a, what a stupid thing. Well, it turns out I was wrong. Everyone was buying like crazy. And here's why. I, I traveled over to Europe and gave a presentation to a big bank in France. And I said, just out of curiosity, what, what enticed you all to buy these things? They said, big spreads. And I said, well, in the United States, generally, at least I, I teach, big spreads means big risk. These things are not risk-free. These things have a lot of risk to them. And they and they said, well, now you tell us. <laughs> I said, well, I think I'm pretty sure you have finance and econ professors in France, too, that told you. Anytime you should see, don't look a gift horse to the mouth because something may be wrong with it. And that's what it was. It was It's great as long as it lasts, but the problem is those those huge spread products don't last very long. Yeah, that they, was, they mispriced completely the risk premium or, or yeah. lack of risk premium. But I just want to clear up something else, John. Please. We said that you know, we're going to downsize the banks. Well, that never happened. In fact, the banks are bigger now than they were during the crisis. Remember they said, because we, we chose to bail out the banks and the investment banks, and which we should have, and again, don't strike me. Um, <laughs> I'm waiting for a thunderbolt from above from coming from D.C. They should have let some of the banks go out. That's the only way after a big crisis to let the market clear. That You know, to Tony, there. that's exactly what I was thinking at the time. I thought these big banks and there's lots of regional banks and smaller banks and they'll get bigger and it'll all, you know, in a, a year or two, it'll all be copacetic. Mm -hmm. But they didn't allow that to happen. Did you know that the Federal Reserve at any time could have prevented some of these bank mergers from the banks getting bigger? That's that's they can have they they can do it by deposit by state. They have rules governing, you know, how big the banks can be. Oh, and they let they let the banks, even though it looked like this is kind of deleting competition, they let the banks merge anyway. This is mostly under Bernanke, 
So the banks were merging and we're going, time out, time out. I thought you said we wanted to downsize everything. Now these too big to fail banks are even bigger to fail. Too bigger to fail. Yeah, too bigger to fail. <laughs> nice grammar, but uh, that, that's, so they didn't, <laughs> I gave you that one, but we didn't do anything about it. So now we have bigger banks out there. And that, that this is partly one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve kept rates low so long for, uh, so low for so long and had this massive expansion of their balance sheet. Well, so they're protecting the banks. Yeah, I, I kind of got the feeling at the time that Treasury was talking to some bank and say, would you buy this? Up? Would you buy Countrywide? Would you buy this and take care of it? And so then after that, they were on the same team. It's like, I, I covered you on that, so you need to help me on this. And so it seems like Wall Street and the Treasury and the Fed and the SEC were kind of one industry, really. They weren't... Yeah. It was one company or one... And, and that's the great point, John. It wasn't so much the problem with um, Glass-Steagall. The problem is the government became too close to the banks. Treasury and the banks were almost acting as one. And it's not a political issue. This was Paulson under Bush. Remember his uh, back of the napkin bailout? Um, all these things were just... Yeah, he scratched out all the bank bailouts on a napkin. Wow, I got to look up that story. <laughs> well thought out, well analyzed. Yeah, but any case, um, so this is this part of a bigger problem, and we have we've we haven't made this any better. Okay, so so Tony, what's the solution? Can this? Uh, I guess you, you said earlier that it, it would, couldn't happen as bad, um, and it was like a real estate asset bubble which brought down the entire economy. We probably wouldn't see that again. I think we probably have bubbles maybe in San Francisco and Seattle on real estate, but that's not going to mm -hmm. be a national disaster. Yeah. Um, do we have? Do you, are you feel secure in the safety mechanisms that have been put in, or did, did they just use? Oh, this is my example. Did they just use the crisis to do silly stuff that didn't really solve the problem? One, they started to add this whole right um, amount of regulation for home appraisers, it's mm -hmm. like. That really wasn't the problem, but somehow that, that made them look good. Well, we regulated the appraisers. I, I think that just means that the appraisers didn't have any lobbyists in Washington. And so that's why they got regulated. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I, and again, I, I think that I think blaming the appraisers on this was really a, a real stretch. Yeah. But there, there's a there's school of thought. Of the, the appraisers collude. No, no, they didn't. Yeah. If you have rapidly rising prices in Phoenix appraisers on houses are going to look at recent transactions as, as he bumping them up. I had, a, no I had one in like 2004 where the appraisal came in low, but the guy says, no, he actually called me and said, you know, um, the appraisal is going to come in low, but I know of a home that's going to close next week. And if I use that as a comp, after it closes, then you'll be okay. So if you just put off the closing for a week, then we're, you'll go pathetic. And that's exactly what happened. And yeah. Now, yeah. those type of things, I think they've clamped down on those. And as usual, like with any regulation, the pendulum swings. It swung too far. For my One of my next door neighbors had a house that was underwater and he wanted to try to refinance and couldn't because this new, right after the crisis, this new regulatory regime on appraisers that said, nope, we're, we're appraising your house at $200,000 less than what you think it is. Oh. Said, but there's no evidence. Okay. Anyway, this is just, yeah, it just happens like that. Now, the big issue was, once again, we had a massive expansion of credit. Okay, good. Some of the political reasons. And we're not doing that right now. In fact, we're not expanding credit hardly at all. It's barely backed up to where it was in about 2007. Okay, good. Uh, one of the things, uh, my flaw, difference between the, the movie, uh, the big short, and kind of my philosophy on it was that it, this was kind of a bit of an open secret because you could talk to mortgage guys in Phoenix who were saying, you know, these are loans are nuts, but the people we sell them to keep telling us, hey, do your people know these are no doc loans and we're not going to check their income? Whatever they write down there. So the mortgage guys would say, hey, you know, you have to have an income of 400000 a year to get this loan. I'm not going to, we're not going to verify it. I just want to tell you. And, <laughs> and so it seemed like all the way up the line that it was kind of an open secret. That which is different than the movie. The movie was making it as oh, it was just these few people that understood it. But everybody yeah. was making so much money. Who, who was going to stop the music? And well, it was John, just outsiders who were the ones who kind of stopped the music because they weren't 
deeply embedded in the system. Well, see, the point I made on that, with the one chart explains it all. Everyone in Washington and New York had this chart or could get it. Hmm. They could see the skyrocketing house prices, skyrocketing subprimes, skyrocketing arms. And you mean to tell me that you didn't see any problem with that? Of course, they all saw it. And you're right. As long as they're making it, and as long as, as delinquencies are, are tame, why not just keep rolling the dice? Which is what happened. Yeah. Delinquencies up until about 2007 were very well mannered. Just then, 2007, they started creeping up. And then go to Q4, 2007, and 2008. And then they almost looks like a moonshot. But up until then, we're saying, hey, uh, nothing's going wrong. Everything's fine. We, we can make these risky loans. I remember somebody at either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, I won't discuss which one, told me in confidence, said, this is a new economy. Risk doesn't matter. Mm. And I went, really? You believe that? I goes, yeah, well, but look at the numbers. I said, I see the numbers. I see the fact we're making, you know, lower down payment loans constantly, higher f- subprime. Freddie and Fannie were buying those until they bought the securities. But they were saying, but this could be the new, the new world. And I said, you know, the problem is the new world is the same old world. It just hasn't happened yet. Once the delinquency starts spiking, then you're going to be running for cover. And they will. All it's going to take is one economic shock, like the housing bubble slows down. Then all of a sudden yeah. they stop building. Yeah. And then suddenly places like Phoenix, my gosh, all your, your workers kind of vanish into thin air. Yeah. Then the economy tumbles, but it tumbled nationally. But again, that's an exogen- That's a shock. It's an endogenous shock, actually. Because, no, I don't think Christian Bale saw all the housing starts slowing. And his character in the movie. Mm-hmm. Right. I think this is something, you're, we see a lot of you know, subprime mortgages being originated. And he's right, there were. There's a lot of CDOs. Is that a cause for alarm per se? No. CDOs, actually, I don't like them per se because they're in between uh, the investor and the issuer. So, like, you and I can't see CDOs. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There, there's no transparency on them. I don't like securities like that. But there's nothing that says that, you know, Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns could have issued one and another investor could buy it. Nothing wrong with that. But uh, I just don't like them because I can't see what's going on. It would be nice if we could have seen it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But, but we saw how subprime was underperforming for a while. So we knew something had to hit the CDOs. Yeah, I remember at the time thinking these people like when they're doing pick a pay, which just blew my mind. <laughs> that was in two thousand, the second half of two thousand and five, because sales, home sales, tanked. They peaked in two thousand and five, and so I, they came out with crazy and crazier products after that to try to boost sales, uh, taking higher and higher mm-hmm. risk. But I kept thinking these people think they're selling the mortgage, they're not. They're just betting on home prices because if home prices quit appreciating, there's no way. <laughs> and and that's work. right. And- and you did have flippers in Phoenix galore, if oh. you remember that. Oh, yeah. It, it, people would just get buying homes like this and wait one year and dump them, buy another one. Kept boosting up the ladder of prices and then eventually came to an end. And a lot of the flippers, they thought they had cracked the code. They would buy a house, change the countertops or whatever, and then sell it. And they thought they had cracked the code, but just the whole market had gone up in that six months. And so they were- yeah, a- absolutely. It was just, it was draw driven by. Again, a massive credit expansion, which allowed for housing prices to, to soar through the roof. Now you have a different problem. Now you have Los yeah. Angeles, San Francisco, of, of skyrocketing housing prices, but not so much due to indigenous buyers getting a new mortgage. We have a lot of foreign investors coming in, into right. California, buying, and Phoenix, I'm sure you have a drove of them. You used to have, I, we always call them Canadians. Oh, Canadians. <laughs> well, the, the, the exchange rate moved against the Canadians, so they, yep. they've kind of dried up. They dried up in China. Yeah, China, they haven't discovered us yet in Phoenix. Um, but I, I think what we, if we do see something like in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, it'll be like Houston in 1982. You know, it'll be just sort of regional. They have a, instead of an oil bubble, is tech is sort of San Francisco's oil. Uh, I, I agree. But the Federal Reserve has created, helped to create massive asset bubbles everywhere. Stock market, yeah. housing market. Right. Commercial, commercial real estate, even like office buildings, are selling now at a you know huge increase since the Fed entered the market. Despite the fact that I think the average vacancy rate on office buildings is like sixteen and a half percent. Okay, here's a question for you: Is there <coughs> why? 
I assume they're doing that because the bankers will lend them money for that, and they won't lend them money to build single-family homes or something. Is there a sort of a, a what a trend or fashion what in, within banks on what to lend that everybody kind of moves in the same direction, and they decided, okay, multifamily was the way to go, or commercial. Oh, well, after the bubble, um, the, the banks actually determined that they had too much real estate on their books. But what they meant by thought of real estate was construction loans, construction development loans. We have too many of these. So there's, they were told to kind of cool it on the construction development loans. That's partially one reason why I see a lot fewer developments going up and less building than you did back in the last decade. That's just cool it. Don't make these anymore or make a lot less of them. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to go out and fund office buildings. Actually, it's done usually through insurance companies and CMBS, et cetera. But okay. yeah, the market's changed a little bit, but not in a predictable fashion. Uh, because just remember Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park, life will find a way. <laughs> if they want to build a bubble again, they will do it. Because, you know, have you seen what's happening at like Freddie and Fannie and FHA? Oh, they're making Remember it they're lower saying, and lowering their standards. Yeah, lowering, lowering. The, now, they don't. They're lowering their credit requirements a little bit. It's not hellacious, but the way they're doing it is they're lowering it down payment. So now they're going three, three and a half percent, three percent. And now I think Fannie Mae even has that one program where they will, you can borrow money to pay your down payment. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's only in certain to neighborhoods. Make that illegal. <laughs> and they're doing that in concentrated in certain low-income neighborhoods. It's like, oh that's my right. God, that's the worst possible. Do you get in? Do you want to have people with bad credit buying homes in your neighborhood? So next, there's a downturn every ten years. So that during the next down year, you're gonna have more foreclosures than the next neighborhood over. I haven't testified in Congress. In fact, I was in front of the, uh, the several members of the Congressional Black Caucus in the House. And I, I pointed out the, the default rates on African-American households in, in the inner city. And I said, do you really want more credit expansion in the inner city when your default rates were like 50% in this one city? I mean, that's, that's almost life ending. How can you it build wealth? How can you build wealth in a home? But you can't. I, I, that people thought, okay, we want to help people build wealth. Homes help people build wealth. So let's just make people buy homes. And then they lowered the standards so low that it um, – Destroyed wealth. Yeah, I, I, I was I actually was going, oh, my God, I can't believe we're doing this again. But again, for those poor inner city households, we tighten credit and everyone else and suddenly expand credit. That's the public policy aspect of it. Yeah. The, the same thing with the 1995 National Homeownership Strategy. Expand credit to those who can't really manage it very well. What are you thinking? We have something called rental properties, which are clean. They're very nice. What's wrong with that? And when you give it to somebody else, the people who were responsible, it hurts their property values. The ones yes. that you're hurting the people. Uh, well, so, there's, so there's usually a huge dislocation between public policy coming out of Washington and reality. Well, I mean, I understand it. As I say, I feel like I would like to see low-income households own a home. And but become we wealthy. I mean, and we wealth. know empirically those households don't gain wealth through home ownership because a lot, you know, a lot of them go into bankruptcy or, or go into foreclosure and they end up worse off than they started. Totally. So you know, I, mean, I understand that. The other thing I learned recently was that in Canada, 5% down is the minimum. Mm -hmm. And they had, tend to have really stable home prices. That There's other reasons, but I think that could be <laughs> one of them. It, it is and, until recently. Oil prices are killing. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't want to own a home in uh, Calgary right now, or or, or in Vancouver, because oh. then you you have the Chinese money coming, in, and now they can build a bubble that's the size of Mount Everest. Oh, that's amazing. What if the Chinese? Well, that's a whole different subject. Is what uh, happens if they change their policies in China, and, or the just the demand? The Chinese decide the economy tanks in China. And they don't want to buy in San Francisco anymore. Wow, that would have or, a big impact. Well, they've already been devaluing their currency like crazy. I mean, China's doing a great imitation of Argentina. They're really devaluing everything. And they may get to a point where people in there won't be able to run, and they're kind of stuck in China. Yeah. Hey, well, okay, well, anything you want to – I'm taking so much of your time, Anthony. Tony, I appreciate it. No, uh, no, no. Tell everyone to go see The Big Short just to watch Christian Bale, if nothing else. It's a, it's a great – 
exciting movie? How did they make something so complex, entertaining, is beyond me. They did some weird stuff, like they would have the guy talk directly to the camera, and sometimes it would just cut off a word. This, I haven't seen this before. Somebody would be talking, and you wouldn't hear the last of the word. So they're trying to make the pace super fast and exciting. Well, it's it's great. It's it's actually I, I, the book I liked it better than Margin Call. I think it's a, it's not as Margin Call. I was actually laughing at during the movie. I'm like, oh, this is idiotic. We saw this coming. Come on, but this one actually seems like it's going to be a lot better. Yeah, I think it's going to have an impact on the political scene, and because it will get, like I said, award nominations, Academy Awards, and so people it'll be in their psyche, and it's teaching people. It is a basically mm-hmm. it's made learning fun somehow. Because I, I think their big goal and why they got so many high, important actors and actresses doing bit parts is because uh, of the message. It got a little bit appreciated for, you know, a minute or two, but generally it was. It's it was Hollywood. Yeah. Of course, they're going to get preachy. But again, I, if, I would love to be able to show it to my students, but Paramount Pictures would sue me to death if I did. <laughs> So the show snippets. <laughs> yeah, just to sign it as homework. Okay, Actually, well, one of, my, one of my former students is in the movie. Whoa! He plays Ryan Gosling's assistant. No, really? Yeah, that was cool. He wrote me an email and said, "Hey, you were talking about this a long time ago." So I said, "We just made a movie about it." Oh wow! That's great. I said, "A student remembered my lectures. That's even better." I, I think this movie is going to make studying finance cool. You're going to have hipsters now studying finance in your classes at George Mason University. It, it would be nice. It would be nice. <laughs> okay, well, good. But I'll send you those charts. Good. I'll put the charts in and then uh, I'll insert them. Hey, well, good. Um, I owe you a huge, huge favor, Tony. This has been great. Oh, uh, congratulations! It's fun, and I love your charts. Keep the charts coming, because it's, okay. it's funny because you got this. You've developed this whole different way of communicating. It's just. In the chart. It's like haiku or something. Just, <laughs> it's Sanders communicating. It is. My colorful charts. Yeah. So, oh, subscribe to him on confoundedinterest.com is his blog. Confoundedinterest.com. Yeah, confoundedinterest.com. Okay. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Sure. Bye-bye. Take care.